and excellent all right folks people on facebook people on zoom rich and anthony thanks for joining us man uh, we'll have people on facebook here real quick uh really appreciate everyone tuning in and the gentleman who i'm talking with today someone i started listening to probably 1974 or so when i was 13 and i'm telling you man I still listen to him a lot and uh, watch his videos and his postings. And of course, I'm talking about the one and the only Mr. Mike Clark. Welcome, my friend. How are you doing, Sir, man? I'm doing great, bro. How are you? Doing thanks. really well, thanks. I feel really good today. I got through the COVID stuff. I had COVID and I had a lot of post-COVID symptoms, but I'm fine now. I'm feeling good. Oh, that's great. Yeah, you told me about that. I forgot. I got my second COVID shot the day before yesterday. Good, actually good. i'm glad i'm glad yeah to hear that. now are you getting any or is it like you don't have to do any of that or well i have antibodies for a while but i am gonna get it uh march 14th and then three weeks after so cool yeah gotta cool. get it yeah so, um yeah i'm glad you got it so how are you doing are you you feeling good at every how's life how's everything well you know what man it's it's really weird i i have this weird career where when most people are extremely busy doing all kinds of stuff, I'm like moderately busy. But mm -hmm. whenever there's a crisis, this is true, or during the holidays when nobody's working, I always work constantly. Mm -hmm. When nobody's working, I work. I have a huge schedule. When everybody's working, and I feel like I should be working as much as everybody else. I have a moderate schedule, but all in all, it balances out. And I guess it it's cool. It works for me. I mean, I've survived all these years. At a level, but right now during COVID, I'm saying all this to say during COVID, I've been working my butt off <laughs> all kinds of stuff. You know, it's most of it's from home, but mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm busy. I don't, okay. I have a record out, uh, coming out in july i'll give you just a, and then i'll let you oh, ask yeah. questions i gotta tell oh, you this. go for it yeah i got one out uh, with mike zilber coming out on sunny side uh and it's called mike drop because we're both the leaders it's a jazz record so, and with peter barche and matt, matt clark nice. and i'm on one now with uh uh, uh leon lee dorsey's record which is number seven uh, in Jazz Weekly, it's really jumped oh. up on the charts, and it's with Harold Mayburn. It's a trio, and it was Harold's oh, yeah. last record. It was the last oh. record he made. It's out right Jeez, now. Man. Yeah. And okay. then I have another one with Leon Lee Dorsey, Michael Wolf, and myself. That's on the last legs of being on the charts. It's fallen off the charts, and uh, mm -hmm. we played all Beatles stuff, but we played it straight ahead jazz style, which is kind of interesting. We didn't do any funk. It's straight on. It's all swing almost. Mm -hmm. And in closing, Michael Wolf has a record coming out next month with me and Mark Eichem on it and John B. Williams live at Vitello's. So there's my history. I just gave you my entire resume. <laughs> oh, no, there's a lot more before that. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. No, that's cool, though. I'm glad. First of all, I'm glad you're healthy. I'm glad Thank you're you. feeling good. You, I'm glad you're busy you and you're doing well. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, we have a bunch of people with us. Anthony Cusina. Uh, ah. Jacob, Jacob Went, Rich Larson, Jimmy Phillips, uh, Kareen Cardegas, and uh, others will be, I'm sure, showing up. Um, so I, I just have to say my first exposure to you uh, was when I was 13. Well, here, here's my brief history when i was nine my dad took me to see buddy rich and i'd already been messing around on drums because my dad was a drummer and so i was kind of just messing around but when i saw buddy when i was nine in 1970 that sealed the deal it's like this is it yeah. i have to be a drummer so then uh huh. yeah i have some comments here so we'll read these soon thanks jimmy and then uh three years goes by I'm 12 and my seventh grade, grade English teacher says, Hey man, I know you love Buddy Rich and Louis Belson and those guys and they're great, but you got to check out Billy Cobham. You got to check out Lenny White would return to forever. Like, okay. So he lays this on me. Well, that got me into a different direction. And it was such a beautiful time in music. So much was happening that was so innovative. 
And then not long after, Headhunters, Mike Clark, Spanko Lee, all that kind of stuff with off the Thrust album over the next couple of years. And I in fact, one of my best friends and I were listening to this, uh, the Thrust last night, um, virtually talking about, damn, this shit was ahead of its time. And that's Mike Clark. And I mean, yeah, I know you're well <laughs> known for that with Herbie, but also all the other stuff you've done, there's just so much. So, um, you, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say in my long winded thinking out loud kind of thing is basically I uh, appreciate you joining me so much because you're one of the guys, man, who had, uh, uh, it was a pivotal, pivotal time for me to discover you and then try to copy you. <laughs> of course, you know, we, we all have to, we, we copy our idols at first and then we hopefully develop our own voice, but you're a big influence. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Well, uh, uh, first of all, that makes me feel really great that, uh, that um, I was able to do something positive for our community, the, uh, the world. And, and uh, uh, that was a very creative, innovative time. We really didn't know what we were doing. Now they've written it all out <laughs> and scienced it all out. But in those days, man, we were just gritting it from our gut. You know what I mean? Like, Paul and I, especially, we were the new guys, and yeah, and uh, you know, I went into the audition with Herbie playing kind of like Elvin and Tony, and he's like, "No, nah, we ain't doing that, bro." You know, I want to hear your funky thing. Paul told me you have your own version of the funk, and I want to hear it. So oh, we cool. put a pillow against the bass drum because I had a little, I had Lenny White's old Gretsch set that he used as little jazz kid. I bought from him. Oh wow! Yeah, he was joined return forever at the keystone corner in san francisco and his drums were too small because those cats were playing much louder yeah this was his advent into electric music so we went over to leo's music in oakland and he wanted to purchase this big set that would cut through so he needed some bread and i said well then i'll buy your gret okay, set yeah. i already had one but this was lenny white's man and so Jeez, yeah, uh, man. yeah so i took that set lenny's uh, set to audition with Herbie Hancock and I played all my uh, jazz stuff. I had no idea what was going on. Paul didn't, even though Paul was my best friend, he didn't tell me much. He said, come on, man, let's go. And uh, Herbie's like, no, man, no, uh, we already did that. I already did all that. I'm looking for something new. Let me hear your version of the funk thing. So they put a pillow up against the bass drum mm -hmm. uh, and I teed off on my funk thing. And he said, yeah, okay, that's it. But, and he hired me right then and there. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. Jeez, man, that's cool. So wait a minute. So if I remember right, uh, you're from the Bay Area, San Francisco area, right? Originally. I was born in, yeah, I was born in Sacramento, but I traveled all throughout my childhood with my dad. And then I relocated in uh, uh, Oakland in about 1960 something or other. In the mid, I graduated high school in 64, went right on the road. Okay. And a couple of years later, maybe 67, I moved to Oakland and, and uh, oh, Oakland, got a yeah. crib there and yeah. started doing business. Oh, cool. <clears throat> yeah, I was in Oakland a couple, this first time I've been in Oakland a couple of years ago. Uh, I mean, I've been to the Bay Area a lot, but for the work I do with the neuro rehab stuff and all that, I've been able yeah. to go out a lot, actually, around the world. I thought I'd be a touring musician going around the world. No, I'm a touring educator for neuro rehab, but whatever. It's cool to see places, and Oakland is a cool place. I like it. Very cool. Did you did you work with Kaiser at all in Oakland? Is that your connection there? No. Or is this its own thing? It's, own, uh, it's a different... Uh, okay. Uh, Just wondering. Yeah. yeah. But, um, well, that's cool. So, it, you know, I don't know if you remember, it was probably around 10 years ago. No, probably less, seven, eight years ago. I was a student going through this nutrition program at SU because after I get into the fitness and physio and movement stuff, I wanted to add dietary capabilities, at least, at least helping people with that stuff uh, in my, my business. So I went to school. But I also knew uh, Eric. Do you know Eric Cohen? Do you remember Eric Cohen, W-A-E-R, Syracuse? I do. Yes, yeah. I know Eric, yes. <clears throat> Everybody knows Eric because he was there for 20-something years. And then they shut off the jazz program like three years ago, which is too bad. But I, I knew him from way back because he would MC a lot of the festivals I'd play and all that. So I started doing interviews 
at the station and you are one of the first pers- people I interviewed, but I was so bad at interviewing. <laughs> it's a wonder you even would talk to me back then. And I was hoping you didn't remember this time, but, uh, <laughs> but it was fun though. It was fun. You had just gotten back from Europe and uh, it- Italy, I think. And you had a new album out at the time, which the name esca- escapes me, but I have the CD downstairs. And, uh, that was our first time talking and it was a blast. So recently I'm like, I've been watching your post on Instagram. You put so much great stuff on it. I got to get Mike to talk. <laughs> I've been in the house like we all, I've been in the house since March. So yeah. when I get bored, I start posting, man, you know, <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah. you know, and also when I teach, you know, if I'm teaching and a, and a, and a student is a beginner, I got my computer sitting right here next to her. So I'm in the drum room now. I'll show you all this stuff later. But, uh, and I'm teaching and the guy's like, he, and he has trouble playing my boom, boom, bop. He's a beginner. So he'll, I'll be like, do that 150,000 times. I'm sitting right here. And then I'll start posting my butt off because I it's hard to sit in there and listen to that. Even though oh, I am yeah. sincere about teaching, it's just like, damn, I can, you know, I can, you know you're like, here you go, bro. Doom. And he's like, okay, I got it. I'm like, no. <laughs> boom, boom. But after about 10 of those, I'm posting. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> man, get where's my, like, work on that, bro. I'll be back in five. <laughs> you know, like, you know, it gets a little. I love it, man. That's great. So, you know, what I was wondering is, uh, so for people watching, we, we have no script. We had actually no idea what we're going to talk about. And we still don't, although I have an idea. Uh, we just knew we were going to have a conversation. Whenever I do it, I kind of pretend well, I finished my espresso, but because ah. when I did, was doing like the more formal from my perspective interviews, it was horrible. So I look at it as let's just have a conversation like we're sitting and having coffee somewhere. And my first question, if we were to sit down and have coffee or whatever, I'm curious to know, because we did not talk about this when I was at the radio station, like, how did you get into music drums? And I'm sure you've probably answered this question a thousand times. So just maybe a <clears throat> real brief history on that. And maybe just your, your main influences, you know, where, where are you coming from with that? Well, my father was a drummer also. Mm, okay. And so there was always a drum set and he wasn't a very good drummer. So he quit when he was about 19 before I was born, but the drums were always around. Mm-hmm. And he uh, also had a hell of a jazz record collection that he played constantly. Mm-hmm. And uh, he also worked for the railroad, so he traveled. So I started playing at four years old. And I, I've been hearing the music since I was born because he'd been playing it every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a social cat, so he had like friends over all the time drinking and listening to jazz. Mm-hmm. So my brain, I guess, took all that in. And uh, I, I could uh, somehow play right away. The first time I played, I played kind of a Gene Krupa Tom Tom thing, and it all made sense. So he took me to a club that night where his friends were playing and had me play with the band. And then when he traveled, then I kept playing. And uh, when he traveled, he would take me to the nightclubs all the time, like three and four nights a week when I traveled oh, with him cool. and have me play with the bands, pay the drummer five oh. bucks or the band leader or buy the band drinks or whatever. And then I, I'd sit in and this was part of my, uh, and, th- and he, since he traveled all over the United States, this happened regionally everywhere, New Orleans, Savannah, oh. Atlanta, Texas, this, that, and the other, Pennsylvania, New York. Wow, and uh, so, yeah, by the time I was 12, 11 or 12, I'd racked up a serious amount of flight time on the bandstand. Yeah. So I was a professional. I started playing gigs really young, mm-hmm. you know, so that's it. No, that's cool, though. I mean, there's nothing better than just getting immersed into it. And uh, especially with experienced players where the bar mm-hmm. is automatically risen for you and you have to meet a certain demand. So if you're going to get into it and be serious and you. Well, some people have the knack, some people maybe not, but, you know, either way, it's like yeah. you have to perform and you learn nothing like learning on the bandstand. That's where I did all the, I'm you not know? a drum room guy. 
I'd learned it all on the spam stand. I had older cats giving me advice, telling me what not to do, what to do, what they liked, what they didn't like, this, that, and the other. And I met a million drummers, professionals, mm -hmm. very high level drummers. I met them all, you know. And uh, at the beginning, I was like Gene Krupa, you know, uh, Zudi Singleton, mm -hmm. Lionel Hampton, Buddy Rich, Louis Belson couple other guys and then like my father brought uh, home an art blakey record when i was eight or nine oh, and when wow. i heard that i went that did it that i changed my direction like that afternoon i didn't know what i was doing but i had to play some it blew my mind not the drumming blew my mind but the band blew yeah. my mind you know what i mean he, uh, the, oh my goodness he always has great bands he was like an, an institution right yeah oh, yeah, big, yeah. Definitely. Like he, like he and Miles and, you know, there were, there's been people along the way that if you work with them, if people work with them, it's like going to a university. And like Art was one of those guys. Oh, my goodness. He cranked out set. some of the greatest players. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. And some of the greatest music, you know, still yeah. that music today. It sounds more modern to me now than it did in 1955 and 65 and 75 and 80. But now I... The, the more I listen to it, how ahead of their time all those people were that he played with, and, you know, everybody. You know, I mean, the, the arrangements, the groove, the language, the whole thing is like, whew, you yeah. know. Yeah, I would. I agree with you on that too. Um, you know, I've been digging back here. I, I stopped playing live just over seven years ago intentionally because my rehab business. I'm just really into this memory cognitive and movement rehab for people with parkinson's and movement disorders but the bottom line is um i needed time off and in my time off after not listening to anything intentionally for about two years i started listening and i started more current music and then worked my way back you know so i'm, I'm back into some of the train stuff from the 50s elven stuff even like baby dodds and papa joe because I never really explored them. And, you know, Papa Joe had a thing. I don't know. If you, did you ever know him or meet him? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I have Does, a hell of a story, but go ahead. I, no, I don't. I won't. Just, you know. Oh, no, no. I, I don't have too many stories. But uh, what I'll say is just off the, uh, on a tangent here. One of the things that people love to hear are stories. Uh, Dennis Chambers the other day. I mean, we've only known each other really well for a couple of years, but God, the stories. Oh my gosh. And it's so much fun. Like the one where <laughs> Miles called him up to offer him a gig and that whole thing was so funny. But uh, yeah, so any stories you want to tell, totally cool. So Papa Joe, uh, you know, the guy had a thing and I didn't realize it because I went from big band to Headhunters Mahavishnu, uh, Billy Cobham, Return to Forever. And, and I went forward and I didn't go backward for a long time. I didn't look into the 60s, 50s miles, 60s, 50s train. And then before that, and I'm finally getting into it at 60 years old. I'm finally getting my act together, learning some of the roots of this stuff. So I, I, I'm a late bloomer and I'm going backwards. <laughs> yeah, but that's great because the, uh, it, I mean, it doesn't matter when the research is done. The, I mm -hmm. mean, it's so much. So, well, I go back all the time all, and have been. Mm -hmm. I mean, I keep going back to earlier, trying to find more and dig out more and understand more. And uh, like, and I don't find it. Uh, uh, I find it back in the past. Some, you know, I do mm -hmm. the same thing you're doing, man. I go back and, and, and uh, I knew and I knew some of those guys. I didn't know them well, but I knew them. But I and I heard Papa Joe play a lot. And oh, uh, cool. yeah, and I, I got very drunk with him one night. Like we got hammered in, and I was doing a gig. I'll make this quick. Oh, no. Take yeah. as long, long as you want. Uh, well, <laughs> it's, a, it's a funny story. I, I, I was doing a gig with Vince Garaldi in, at the El Matador in San Francisco, a jazz gig. And I used to play in the kind of in the traditional style, whatever the word is, of Max, Philly Joe. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was modernizing my thing, uh, Grady Tate, Tootie Heath, Mickey Roker. Yeah. 
and this is, uh, but I, uh, I wasn't into Tony and Elvin yet. Uh, they, and, and uh, I, so I went and I heard Tony Williams live with Miles Davis. And I sat right in front of the bass drum. I had no idea. I've been hearing him on records, of course. And then uh, I heard Lenny White live with Joe Henderson. Oh, wow. And I, yeah. And, um, and I met Lenny White when he was with Joe and we became friends. Uh, and then um, I started to change my style. And, and, and at that time, it was considered being more modern. Now, the other thing, in order to work at that time, if you played in the older style, which I did, you could be losing a lot of gigs. They were hiring guys that played in the vein of Tony and Elvin and the, these guys. There was a lot on the West Coast. Sunship was out there, Ralph Penland, oh, right, a lot right. of these great guys. So I started changing. But in my attempt to change after hearing Tony, he played it in an enormous volume for a jazz drummer, I thought. <laughs> I, I put my cymbals way up high and I was playing real loud and all kinds stuff i was trying to do what i heard him do and uh, i wasn't quite sure how to go about it but i was giving it my all and i was also young too i was in my early 20s so i was really stoned when i was doing it and when i came off the and i heard this voice you know matador was a very dark club and i heard this voice say where's the trap drummer where's the trap drummer and i thought well i'm the trap drummer so i followed the voice uh, down this long bar and my eyes are bad anyways I started closing on this guy it was Papa Joe <laughs> and sit your ass down here and buy me a drink and I said okay <laughs> and uh, then he proceeded to tell me I opened all these clubs out here you wouldn't be playing at all if it wasn't for me and when these clubs wouldn't even be open if it wasn't for me you know when before <laughs> you were born I did this that and the other buy me another drink i'm like okay and, and then uh, i was enjoying this and then he's like and all that shit you playing up there you wouldn't be playing i played all that in 1935 <laughs> that much more and he went on and on and on and then i took him out after the gig was over and we went all over town and went to different bars and had many drinks and uh, uh he was a great cat man and he told me a whole lot of stuff wow you know yeah, yeah. That's really cool. Um, you know, I'd heard of him forever, for decades. I just didn't start checking him out until the past few years. And, you know, he had a thing, man. He was foundational in uh, well, uh, in, in many ways. He, he was a leader of the pack. Yes, he was. Belson you know, comes from him. Buddy, Buddy Rich, all those guys loved Papa Joe. You know, I, I used to hear him at the West End Cafe at the towards the end but i'd also heard him as a, my dad took me to hear him a couple of times mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's, this actually this just reminds me and uh i just got this in the mail the other day from Therese de musio do you know her uh the daughter of lenny i don't know her but i know who she is and i see her stuff around yeah oh, the, we exchanged the books because she wanted my book that i wrote about the parkinson stuff she sent me this so uh I'm telling you, man, Tales from the Symbol Bag. Really? Freaking great book. And uh, okay. I've, I've seen it on Amazon like two days ago. Okay. In the States, I think it's available on Amazon, like 20 bucks or so. And there are a lot of great stories. Papa Joe's in here. You might be in here. It's just I, I haven't gotten through it because I've only had it for two days. But it, it's really, really cool. There's so many different, all these pictures from Lenny's. You know, there's, there's one with Louie. You might not be able to see it. There's Louis Belson. I can see that. Yeah. What a classy yeah. guy he was. I got to meet him a few times. What a gentleman, you know, a real gentleman. Total. Yeah. Uh, so there's there's some great stuff in this book. It's classic. And anyways, uh, why did I say that? Because there's stories. The book is full of stories about players. I, drummers. I bet. So much fun. <clears throat> so much I'm fun. looking right now for it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry. I'm look I have a um a book a book out myself i'm looking for it <laughs> oh anyway man. um yeah but go, go ahead um, um whatever wherever oh, well, you were going there let's continue that was fun <clears throat> we have a visitor i want to introduce you to brandy brandy hey like, brandy she wants to go do stuff but hey 
we're not going yet. <laughs> we're going to be a while, sweetie. You might want to go lay down and get a nap. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, she did her business outside and she ate, so there's no problem. Anyways, uh, well, what's interesting about the era that we are in, and, and uh, I'm 60, so uh, I feel grateful that I was born at a time where I, I'm able to see these huge amount of change, innovation and creativity in music stylistically and compositionally and everything where, but you know, that's where digging back into the past, looking at the thirties, the forties, the fifties, the sixties, you know, bird, and then miles and bird and dizzy and bird and uh, miles and train and train and Elvin and miles and Tony and Wayne. And, and then all the other stuff in the seventies, which you're such a part of that. It's a, it's a great era to be alive and witness these amazing things happening in music. You know, huge, huge changes, huge, pivotal, creative uh, uh, stuff. I, I don't even know if I have the words, really. So Well, I, I feel the cool. same way. I mean, I w we worked five nights a week for 50 years, bro. And r r really... You know what I mean? And so now it's quite a shock to my system. I'm okay, uh, just as, uh, as everybody else is. Uh, I just see my book over there. I, I'm okay. Um, and I'm, uh, my calendar looks good. I mean, I'm, I'm doing a, 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 a drum school in Japan, the one in Europe, and I got a, a, a clinic at Matt Patelis on the 24th, which is going to be online. I did a gig cool. last night, this, that, and the other. But anyway, so I'm hanging in there. Uh, but, uh, and of course, I, I have a lot of hopes for the future. I'm not like dark, like, oh man, this sucks. I'm, I'm okay. Um, but on an appreciative tip that I was able to do what I did, I have the uh, huge appreciation thus far. You know, like if it never went back, yes, that would be awful. But at the same time, I got to be really thankful for what did happen because uh, yeah, I missed a lot of things in life, but playing jazz was one, not one of them. I did. <laughs> I, I did yeah. <laughs> so I feel good, good about that. You know, I just, uh, another record I was on recently, I'm not trying to do the Mike, the Mike Clark resume. No, that's what this somebody. is about, man. This is well, a platform uh, for you, Mr. Yeah, Clark. Yeah, I did this and then that. And no, I it's cool. It, <laughs> cool. uh, but uh i i was on uh eddie henderson's last two records the last one's called shuffle and deal and uh I, I, but i'm saying it because also who was on there was kenny Barron and of course eddie uh oh, geez. Yeah, uh, yeah. and yeah gerald cannon and uh and uh, <clears throat> uh and my dear friend donald harrison who to me uh encompasses all that we're talking about from you know, Chick Webb uh, from that era mm -hmm. till now, including all of the New Orleans stuff uh, and, and uh, a very interesting artist with it uh, can make you feel it every time. I mean, he's the well yeah. is so deep, you know, he's a, and he's on there as well. Mm -hmm. And him and Eddie have that uh, magic like uh, Miles and Wayne did. They can play as one guy. They breathe the same, you know, so. so you, you've done a lot with Donald Harrison, haven't you? Yeah, I'd say so. Sure. Yeah, we played I mean, a lot of. Yes, sir. He's on. Yeah. He's on some of your stuff, right? He's on a lot of my stuff and he's on the we've been friends for, I guess, I don't know, 20 some odd years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've done a lot of touring uh, with the Headhunters mm -hmm. in different oh, yeah, right. uh, yeah. incarnations of that band, like organ quartet. Mm -hmm. bass this that and the other we've done electric bass and or no bass organ which is really fun because that way you can play a lot of swing you know and and not just swing but innovative as wallace roney used to say yeah you go like mike play some innovative swing you know some crazy stuff you know and I, with the headhunters you can definitely do that and with somebody like donald uh he can um what's the word i'm looking for he can translate whatever you're doing like in a nanosecond, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not going to throw him anything. He can't, uh, you know, he can, he can hit them all. He can hit them. Yes, he does. 
yeah, and some history mm -hmm. inside of them, you know. Mm -hmm. See, that's that's cool. Um, well, I'm gonna just read a couple of comments here from people. Uh, let's see, let's go back to Jimmy <coughs> Phillip. Jimmy Phillips says, Love Mike's work. Saw him with Jeff Berlin and Scott Henderson in Cleveland. I think Scott Henderson, Scott H of Cleveland oh a God. few years ago. Just listened to the Indigo Blue album the other day. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Jimmy. Indigo Blue. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> and then Appreciate we have another one with, uh, let's see, from Anthony Cusina. I miss seeing you play in New York mm -hmm. City, Mike. Hope you're doing well. Question for you. Could you break down what it is that you play between your left foot and left hand? Uh, it sounds like single strokes, either sixteenths or triplets. Thank you. Let's see. Let's ask that again. Question. Could you break down what it is you play between your left foot and left hand? I can break it down. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. Hey, just, Anthony, in case just, you're listening. <laughs> one, one, one more comment here. Not a question. Just yes. Gary Kennedy. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, for the question. Thank you, Gary, for the comment. He does a nice video on the most famous shuffles. And yes, I've seen that too, and I love it. Great. So, yeah, breaking it down. What's happening on that one, Mike? Hey, um, I have a book out. Okay, this is like, yeah. Um, I have a book out now on Hudson Music called The Post Pop Drum Book. And most of what I do as far as left hand uh, dialogue between the left hand and bass drum is in that book. But yes, I play singles, uh, double stroke rolls between the left hand and foot, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, paradiddal and double paradiddal patterns, but they're all interspersed with each other and underlying it, even if I'm playing really a modern kind of thing, underlying it is always some kind of language or uh, better yet phrasing kind of out of Philly Joe and those guys. I keep that under, you, you probably can't, you wouldn't know that because I'm not, I'm not playing those, you know, set that and bat, um, -da -um it's got that and bat. But that's kind of what I'm hearing underneath, even if mm -hmm. I'm playing really fast. Mm -hmm. So technically the breakdown would be like, doubles, singles, mm -hmm. triplet singles, starting with either hand, double starting with either hand, paradiddles, double paradiddles, and, uh, and who know and all of that interspur intertwined in some kind of musical conversation. I'm not just, I'm never thinking this is a paradiddle or anything mm -hmm. like that, okay. you know? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I'm just playing a flow that goes along with what I'm hearing. That's, how, mm -hmm. that's kind of what I do, you know? <clears throat> that's cool. Thank you for the, uh, sharing that with us. Um, right. If anyone, by the way, if anyone has questions, if, so for those who are with us on Zoom, just put them in the chat box. And let me check. We have a couple of chats, but I think that they're not questions. Oh, maybe. Oh no, no, that's from Anthony. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Anthony. I, I saw it on I saw it on Facebook before. I saw it on Zoom. I'm sorry. Uh, so if you're on Facebook watching, just put a comment in the. Uh, the comments area under the video and i'll be monitoring that i might not get to it right away but we'll get to it so you know i have a question going back you know i i and i i know you talk with people about her the your time with herbie and the headhunters and all that and uh if you don't mind i'm just curious uh if you want to share a little bit about what it was like and i was also curious to know if you're in touch with any of the people like i always like benny Maupin's sound you know he he just had a unique thing happen. And then I know he's still alive. He's in Detroit, I guess. Maybe. No, he's in California, Altadena. He lives in Altadena. Oh, he is? oh okay. Well, he, last I heard, yeah. I, uh, okay. Yeah, me, Bill Summers and I stay in touch. Paul Jackson oh, cool. and I stay in touch. I got a, uh, See, that's cool. I sent Herbie Hancock uh, an email the other day, which he responded and telling me that him and his wife, Gigi, got their COVID shot. And um, I belong to a group called the Stick People now. And mm -hmm. the Stick People, we're just getting ready to launch all of our stuff. Uh, Lenny White, myself, Michael Shreve, David Garibaldi, and Greg Erico, Arico, Greg Arico, 
are yeah. the stick people. And we yeah. interview, we just had a, we're launching our first one, which is an interview with Dennis Chambers. Oh, we, so far, we did cool. a, uh, interviewed Peter Erskine, Stanley Clark, Billy Hart, oh, wow. Mark Isham. We, I can't even think of uh, uh, all the, uh, Steve Jordan, Mm -hmm. and uh oh wow and, yeah and we and we don't just talk drums we talk all whatever happens happens and some yeah. of it's hysterically funny man oh my mm -hmm. god to talk about stories each of these cats have you know a lifetime of road oh, story absolutely yeah <laughs> I, i've heard and it's it. pretty i'm sorry go ahead yeah no that well i just saying it's uh, for me it's so interesting because just with the stick people themselves just interacting with garibaldi and greg and lenny and mm -hmm. Michael, uh, um, man, these are some high level artists Absolutely. and they're thinking way more than just drums. I mean, they're producers and they write and all kinds of stuff is going on and, and, uh, their viewpoint on the world and, and humanity and, um, uh, everything, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've talked with, been very lucky to talk with a lot of my favorite players, drummers and non-drummers. I've, I've known Peter, actually, we figured it out. He and I figured it out the other day. 49 years ago, we met. He was 18 and I was 11. We've been friends ever since. I mean, but him, uh, Jimmy Haslip, uh, and Dennis, the past three years or so, we've gotten to know each other. And there's a bunch of other people, too. At the bottom line is what's really fun is, well, first of all, they're great people. They're great. Yeah. People. And then they do have a, a so many stories and some of them are oh, hilarious. Oh my God. But then some of the conversations are really interesting and they have nothing to do with drums or music. They have to do with life perspective, yeah. thoughts, emotions. Or if I talk with Dave Weckl, we only ever talk about uh, muscle cars because that's what we're both into. So, you know, it's like, what kind do you have? I have a 66 Mustang convertible. Bro, listen, you're talking to the right cat. I mean, I don't, I'm in well, New York yeah. and I would never dare have a car here like that, but I had a 64 Chevy mm -hmm. in 64, 320. Oh, 327? Loaded, baby. Sweet. Yeah. Well, all of them were 320s. Well, you could get a 283, I guess, but that was the engine and it would yeah, wind up real fast. I had, you got you to gotta have the 327, man. You really do. And, and dig this. I had a 58 Chevy that had a 348, three Hearst on, three speed Hearst on oh, the floor. God. And it didn't have the tri power. It only had one four barrel. And it didn't, now that what didn't wind up quick. So off the line, if you're going to race some guy at a red light, I'm not a race car driver, but, but after it, it wasn't as fast as like a 283 would wind up right quick. But mm -hmm. after 60 miles an hour, that's when it started to roll. Oh yeah. my God. And the thing weighed about a ton and a half. So you were. <laughs> yeah. This, Woo. this is the, when, when they got the car, right. Oh, so it needed yeah. a lot of work, but then yeah. uh, the, the outcome is, uh, is this. So is it a two way? Oh, you can reach. Is it 289? 289. Yeah. Oh, four yeah. speed. Uh, well, it's an automatic, and okay. I don't know how many speeds are in that. It's got two drives in it. It's got it. I've never seen it in another car before, except for Ford products. But you know, the bottom line is that car is not going to beat anyone at a light either. It's just it sounds cool, and it feels it's a happy place. You know, it's just a great car. It man. has yeah. like a rhythm. Actually, it has a rhythm to it the way it sounds. And then, but Weckles, he's the one. He's got the vet man. It's actually so many horsepower. That he was, well, I was at his house a couple of years ago, uh, and he showed me a couple of cars. Or no, he showed me the one car he had just gotten, which is a Mercedes wagon, like this real rare engine, like a hundred engines were ever put in the Mercedes like this. And the thing will pin your head back with like G forces. It's amazing. Jeez. He really wanted a wagon, so we got a wagon. But he's got the vet that he can't drive on the street because it's like way too zooped up. And he, he drives it on a track, like 150, 200 miles an hour. I didn't go see that. I didn't do it. But there's videos of him doing that. But dialing back, though, is conversations can be about not drums, not music. Could be cars, could be hobbies, could be with other people. It's cooking. It's trains. It's boats. It's planes. It's life. And, you know, I enjoy those conversations because when I look at it, music and life are just like this 
and life consists of so many things and you throw music in there and it's like there's a relationship somehow in all of it you know it's all well you're playing your life right when you're playing yeah. you're playing your life hey let me show you my book just to change oh it up yeah please bit. please do here's yeah. the post pop drum book you guys oh, nice. and like and what i've done is i just wrote out instead of writing what art taylor plays or writing what philly joe plays or or writing what jack plays i wrote what i play i stand on the shoulders of all those same people so i just thought why don't i do this i talked to uh, 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 rob wallace about it and he said let's do this so i'm mm -hmm. real proud of it and it's doing real good and i use it to teach out of and because i put the phrasing in there so it's not so much what hand does what it's like it gives you the shapes of, mm -hmm. of things so when if you do play jazz music you don't want to think about it like da 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 bang two three four brrr, bash yeah. two, you know it's not drum exercises it's right. I get it from what I do at the gigs you know actually playing with other humans so that's what's in here <laughs> and, you know, and that, I try Anthony says great book by the way I'm guessing Thank Anthony you. has that book yeah that's cool Anthony, you you and I got to get to know each other here. You've been on a lot of these watching, and I'm I appreciate that. Uh, no, that's cool. You, you know uh, who was it? Somebody was saying Terry Lynn Carrington was saying about a month ago, just on a phone call. We were just talking. She says, uh, you know, Wayne Shorter said, "I don't play music. I play life." You know, or something like that. And it was really cool because, like, you just said it yourself. You're playing life. You know? That's what it is, right? Your experience yeah. comes out. And I think, you know, I don't think I ever really understood that that could even be a concept until the past few years after I stopped playing live. So when I re-emerge, and I will to some degree, I'll be playing life because I've learned so much. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot to express. Yeah. Well, you've just know. been through a lot of stuff here, too. Yeah, I'm okay. Uh, you know, with this COVID thing and everything. So all that will come out some kind of way. I mean, that's what we do. That's what our soul imprinted on it is all of our cause and effect. Everything's yeah. on there that we've thought and done. So that's what happens. That's true, yeah. You know, uh, I, I don't think we're playing paradigms. I mean, <laughs> you we're playing. There's nothing wrong with that. You got to learn how to operate the drum set. I mean, you got to yeah. be able to play it. So that's yeah. really important, too. I'm not being uh, weird about that. But I mean, you're playing when you play the music, you're heart comes out it's not always good sometimes the evil anger all sure. kind of stuff you know Absolutely. whatever yeah hey uh mike do you know mike melito in rochester mike melito is an amazing drummer and a friend of mine yes he is i i don't i know him from facebook uh so i don't know him know him but i know him from facebook and i've heard some uh some of his records and he did a record i think was out not that long ago, the last record that he did. The only reason I say that is because I, I had I don't know any of the other records, but that one is killing, you know. Yeah, I, he's a killer yeah. player. He actually I was talking with him on Monday, had him on as a guest. Mike just made a comment here. He says, Mike, meaning you, is great, <laughs> great and a funny guy, and his Facebook videos are hilarious. <laughs> I concur, man. I concur, Mike, Mike Molito. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> cool, man. That's I not... like to I like to drink amaretto coffee and cream, and I don't Ooh, drink yeah. every day, but every once in a while in the daytime because there's coffee, and I go, "This is a daytime drink," and then I go to the computer. <laughs> oh boy! And I've been kicked off a couple of times for <laughs> going over there. You know, like guys have written me like mad at me. I'm like, "Oh yeah, okay." So I don't know. <laughs> uh, let yeah. me show you my drum set. Let's look yeah, at that. Please okay. Do. I, Please Let me do. see if I could. I don't have all of it. I mean, I don't use a lot of drums. I use mm -hmm. the set that I've been playing since I was a kid, which is, you know, a modern tom, a floor tom, bass drum, snare. But I don't sure. have the other symbol up right now because I've been mm -hmm. doing stuff. Let me see if you guys can see this. I'm going to put this here and I'm going to, well, I wonder if I can, I don't see that thing where, where you can turn it around backwards. So here, maybe we could do it like this. You're looking at me now. How's this? Can you see that? Yeah, I see that. Oh, that's great. Yep. Yeah. That's perfect. And uh, here's the old, I'm old school. I don't know if you can see this. I have my name on the drum head. Danny, I love it. Danny, 
Danny Richmond was like, you got to put your name on the drum head if you're going to be out here with us. And I'm like, man, I don't know. He's going like, and so I did it. That's, <laughs> I'm going to play. Cool. I don't know if you can hear this. I'm going to play this symbol for you that I got up here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I just play with one hand. Hold on. Uh, this has got a couple of this. It's a, uh, see if you can see this. Can you see that symbol? Yeah, I see that. Oh, that's beauty. A couple of rivets. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see here. <clears throat> This might not translate. Uh, I don't know what it's going to sound like uh, uh, on oh, give it a Facebook. Try. Yeah, what the hell? All right. We can sort of hear it. Good sound. So I don't know how it sounds out there to you guys. It's, if uh, you know what, I I think if you hold your device further away from the symbol that like might it. work better yeah that's a nice oh, that's a beautiful ride oh, is yeah. that a 22 it is I looks always, like 22 yeah i got a couple of nice 20s and lenny uh and wallace designed those symbols and those symbols are um the sister symbol. This one doesn't sound like it because it's got rivets in it, but I have three or four of them or five of them or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, um, I, I endorse these symbols. And that's Lenny's line, Epoch. And him and Wallace had those symbols made uh, based on the Nefertiti symbol, which uh, Tony's. Oh. Yeah. I played quite a few times. I played, well, two or three times, not quite mm -hmm. a few mm -hmm. times. And uh, over at Wallace's. And um, um the one that i have which is in this symbol case in the front room because i used it last night on the gig i like better than the nefertiti symbol i like it yeah. actually better you know <laughs> um yep yep anyway you know uh i just thought you guys might yeah, like this thing I, full of rivets no last for a half hour so you know you can play you know, right I, back well I, you know i love it actually uh what my favorite ride symbol i had two favorite rides ever uh one of the Istanbuls, and I actually can't remember which one. I just loved the wash on it. I loved everything about it. I could control it so well, and it never got out of control. Oh, boy. You know, even yeah. if you're good at, if you're the best at controlling the symbol, some symbols are made to escape your control, and I, I couldn't can't, deal yeah. with that. So, yeah. uh, but the other one was uh, Bosphorus that I loved, too. But do you know a guy, uh, a gentleman, a drummer named Dave Bronson? He's uh, he would actually play with the Righteous Brothers for like 25 years, and he's uh, he manages a uh, Istanbul Mehmet. Oh, that's uh, business a different. In, uh, that's in, uh, uh, I see. That's yeah. So that is that a different company or just? Oh, uh, it's symbol? a different part of the family. I think they split or something. Maybe like oh, Jones okay. did. I don't know the political, but Scott oh, okay. Lycan is my guy. And okay. uh, uh, and uh, this is uh, Istanbul Epoch and Agop. And oh, right. so it's yeah, yeah. not the amendment symbols, but the, uh, uh, and I love these. I have three or four of these rides. I got a bunch of twenties and some of them you can really control. And some of them are washy. I can't play them, but mm -hmm. I love the note. So I keep them in hopes that I'll learn to play them. This one here, uh, the note lasts long. So you can play way behind. If you, if you want to just slob on shit, you can't, this is <laughs> the simple to do it on. <laughs> you know, the other one I got is kind of tight. And yeah. keeps everything lined up. But this one here, when you have a couple of drinks on the gig, this is a simple drink. <laughs> you let it all, leave it all on the table, you know. <laughs> that's a riot, man. Anyway. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, we have a couple other comments here. Anthony says, Mike's first book is also great. Uh, funk, uh. Drum, funk drumming. And then Gary says, uh, let's see, Mike does solos and changes his left grip in the middle so fluidly. Is that something he developed naturally over time, or did he train himself to do it uh, in an exercise structured way or an ex structured exercise? Yeah, that train, you, you're real good at that fluid changing of the grip. <laughs> well, I got a couple of things that, uh, hey, here's my funk book, by the way. It's, yeah. You know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Self promote, like a shameless self. Uh, um, it's all, uh, it's all good. Do it. Uh, that's why we're look, here. Okay, sometimes I'm when I play bebop, when I play more 
in the Philly Joe, first of all, I, no matter what I play, even if I wrote out everything and I have read and played a lot of his stuff that's written, I don't sound like him. Nobody can sound like that guy. I sound like a guy that's playing those licks, but, and I've been doing that since junior high, <laughs> sure. you know, like, uh, but this right here, when I'm playing more of a bebop style, now, I don't know why, nothing to do with chops. I just hold the stick like this. Mm -hmm. I can cut the sound of the drum off like Blakey did in Philly Joe. I can play one stick on the other stick. And it just, I guess it's maybe because I can, I don't know why. And the mm -hmm. licks are different. They're more Wilcoxon and rudimentary. So for, it works for me. When I'm playing like the modal thing and it's a bash, all out bash and war, mm -hmm. or I'm playing funk, man, I get way back here like this because I feel I, I don't... I'd yeah, rather play okay. with the fulcrum thing, but it don't work, man. I For the sounds I need out of the snare drum, which is a million sounds, I, I need the meat and the fat of yeah, this kind of thing. Yeah. And, yeah, and also, man, sometimes I have uh, like a really lousy grip. It can be way up in the air, like almost there. whatever. I mean, if I had to hold the stick in my teeth during the heat of the moment and the, uh, <laughs> during the fire, I would. I yeah. can't be thinking about all the fulcrum and the, but when I'm practicing, I have a really good looking grip and I try to do it the right way. But when I go to the gig, all bets are off. I don't give a damn about paradiddle, this grip, that yeah. not, or, or match whatever, because it's like, you have to be like a minute, man. You got to respond or not respond. And even not responding is a re response. So I, I, if I'm yeah, worried about is. how my hands look or if that, no, I can't do it. I, no, some of know, my friends can. Mm -hmm. They just naturally play that way. I don't. You know. By, by the way, uh, Rick Latham is with us watching on Facebook. Oh, my goodness. Hey, he Rick. says, hey, Mike, and hey, Carl. Rick, hey. how you doing, man? Rick is cool, man. I love that guy. Tell Rick to quit being so funky. I watch all those videos. videos. I want to <laughs> hang up my funk. I want to hang up my funk whatever sticks hang up you hang know? up your hang-ups hang up my hang-ups yeah man rick is a funky dude and much more he got some crazy chops one time i went to his house to play with him and man he had all kinds of schemes and and he's a powerful dude too he can he, he, hit you know i, I see i haven't cat. seen him live but i've been watching Woo! videos i'm like yeah he okay. can knock it out of the park he's got man. some dexterity yeah. happening there sure. oh no he got a whole bunch of stuff that dude is bad <laughs> <laughs> He says, all good. You guys are rocking. Well, thanks, Rick, man. It's it's great to get to know you too, Rick. It's, our conversations have been really fun. And uh, um, and on a side note, I talked with Dave last night, just so you know. Oh, yeah. And I sent you a text and I had a lot of typos in it. So I'm sorry. <laughs> so anyways, but anyways, uh, Rick says, uh, Mike is the real deal. You know what? That's a term I like to use because you are the real deal, man. Uh, don't sell yourself short. Evander the you real the deal, funk, holy man. Feel. <laughs> <laughs> Evander the real deal, holy. Feel. Are you a oh, boxing yeah. fanatic? Oh my God! I don't even get me started. We'll do the whole thing on boxing. I can't also, box apples, man. I'll tell you right now. But I'm a big. I know. I met Ali. I, I played a gig with Frazier, I, and I, you know, I met. I ran the Blade, Barkley, Vinny Paz, oh, bro. Man. Well, mm. I, okay, I got one for you. Okay. So I live in Syracuse and maybe 30 minutes away is um, Canastota Boxing Hall of Fame is there. So from about Oof. 1980, uh, 89, 90 till maybe 96 or seven, I was in a band where the, the leader of the band, Joey Fiato. Joey, if you see this, I love you, brother. And I miss you. He's in Naples, Florida now. Really great vocalist with the best internal clock because we used to mess with the bar line all the time and it wouldn't we could never mess him up but anyways uh so anyways we're uh he knew i i forget his connection but bottom line we got to play the hall of fame induction dinners every year for years oh boy. so okay i didn't uh sorry one second i didn't meet ali or holyfield but i got to meet <laughs> I got to meet uh oh Ken Norton many times. Oh, and, uh, oh. Joe Joe Fraser. Joe Fraser sure. sat in with us, actually. He sat in a couple uh, of times. Of course, yes. Sugar yeah. Ray, Marvin Hagler, uh Whitaker, Pernell Whitaker. Uh oh, you met Pernell Sweepy Whitaker, man. Oh my goodness. 
So, you know, yeah. it's really fun because, uh, I mean, Ken Norton, he's a big dude, man. He was a big guy. I'm 6'2", and he was taller. And after he got out of boxing, he he had an accident, so he had trouble walking. Yeah. He could walk, but yeah. he got into bodybuilding. The guy was freaking massive, right? So I have a picture of me doing this with my measly bicep next to his. Guess who dwarfs me? He does. And then I remember uh, we're he he liked to drink. I forget what it was, but we're talking. Yeah, met him a few years in a row. One night he said, "I'm sorry, this is about you, not me." But I'll just tell you this, anyways, because I like boxing. No, I'm loving this. Go ahead. <laughs> we're go to we're Graziano's restaurant, and he's talking. He's like, you know, we're, I don't know what we're talking about. He was talking about the punch that the undercut that took Ali off the ground, knocked. Yeah. Him over. Yeah. yeah, that's a kind of a famous punch right there. So yes, sir. He says, "Yeah, yeah." He says, "Okay, uh, it's been nice talking to you. Uh, goodbye." And he takes me and he just shoves my body out of the way <laughs> <laughs> to go meet the pretty girl that just showed up at the bar. Oh yeah, okay. First they left five minutes later, and we never saw him again. But I mean, it was really, uh, it was so much fun to meet those guys. You know. So I, I met Joe Frazier on a gig and, and we were drinking afterwards and uh, uh, in the dressing room and all he I wanted to talk about boxing and all he wanted to talk about was uh, monitors and mixers and microphone. He was serious about. <laughs> yeah, the he music. was. He, he wanted to be uh, uh, Otis Redding, I guess it was kind of what it sounded like in, in or the attempt. And but uh, um, he had this roadie that was a massive dude you know ali was a big dude i don't know if you met ali but he filled out a whole door he was very yeah, I didn't know big. him i never met and him when he was younger and, mm -hmm. and when he was in his mid uh, early in the mid 30s when i met him he was really big man i didn't mm -hmm. know he was that big. he doesn't look that big on tv he's, he's huge yeah, he's and uh but anyway uh so this roadie came through the room and said to joe and joe and me and another guy were drinking uh Segrum's vo out of the bottle that was his drink <laughs> and he drank it right out of the bottle we're all and Joe's sitting down and he's like, you know, this thick, you know, he's like yeah, a big he's, guy. He's, he's, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, and he, he, he liked, he liked to drink said, too. I remember he when he like sat to... in with us a couple of times, he had had a few each time. And actually it was kind of funny uh, and, and rest in peace. We love you very much, Joe, but you wouldn't get off the stage. It didn't sound so good towards the end. <laughs> but it was still a blast. Oh, well, it was so much know, fun, man. Well, did what he said. He, we were drinking pretty good too this night after the gig, you know, and so, and, uh, and this, his roadie came through this big guy and he said, yeah, you know, Ali can uh, pity Pat do all that dancing, but, uh, but he can't hit. And Joe Frazier said, Oh yeah, then you should have been in there with that motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that with my own too. I was standing I, right I, next to him. I'm like, okay. Yeah, man. My uncles were all boxer, Italian boxers, five oh, of them. Really? Okay. Cool. One of them was extremely talented. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he won, uh, he fought hundreds of fights in those days. They were all pretty much brain dead at the end, but they used to take tickets. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them took tickets at the Sacramento Memorial. I had to get backstage, and I met Sonny in Sam Woodyard. And uh, I saw Cly uh, Melvin Parker when he was playing with uh, James Brown, Ray oh, Charles. Um, oh, wow. I saw everybody there. And I could get in free, and then I had the run of the joint because my uncle worked there, see? That is so cool. Um, I was just – I have a picture somewhere of that Ken Norton thing. Not that anyone wants to see. Oh, here, actually, here's another one. This was a surprise birthday, early 1990s. He wasn't real well-known, but he was the heavyweight champion at the time as uh, – Riddick Bow. Oh, I, 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 he's from Brooklyn. I dig Riddick and, Bow. And I'm, I'm, I'm right next to the sax player. I'm six two. Okay. And Rocco Barbado okay. six three. So Bow's got to be six five or so. Or six, yeah, he's a big dude, man. Yeah. Look at my mullet. Holy cow! But that yeah, was a surprise a... birthday party, and there's Joey oh. in the in the black jacket. So we nice. had a blast playing uh, parties for these guys. And George Foreman, he's the other one we met who was freaking funny. He's very funny. We actually laughed so hard at my face and abs hurt for a couple of days. Yeah. I worked this joint in Harlem called Whit Wells. Been mm -hmm. there for years. It's gone now. It was, used to be a jazz club. Mm -hmm. And uh, I lived around the corner. It was right next to 135. 
and uh, um, and uh, uh, I had a trio in there um, for about. I worked in there for about a year, and then I had my own group in there for about a year. And I would, uh, and uh, I we would watch all of the Riddick Bow Holyfield fights in there. And uh, yeah. I was right down the street when Mike Tyson. I was playing right down the street when Mike Tyson knocked out Mitch Hard Rock Green man, oh, on the geez, street. Man. And it oh, wasn't very wow. far from where I was working. The word came up there right away. Hey, man, Tyson just not here. <laughs> yeah. I miss that Tyson, was... too. I didn't see him. Uh, Ali and Tyson are the two I really wanted to meet. I didn't get to meet. Uh, um, but uh, we might have to do part two just about other stuff like boxing. And I'm life, sorry. Right? I got carried away. Yeah. No, I love it, man. See, that's the thing about this is we don't know where it's going to go. And we don't have to know. But it, we're following an organic pathway of conversation and we're talking about life too. So I just love that. Um, by the way, Rich Larson says, Mike, got anything planned or anything happening with the headhunters? The headhunter guys. We do. <clears throat> we have a record hey. that's been in the can and a company uh, out of New Orleans has the record, but due to COVID, they didn't want to put it out. We also oh. have a management company uh, uh, an agent, I should say, in Europe. <clears throat> so we can tour if we ever decide to again. Uh, right. I'm not a big fan of this is going to uh, probably not leave me in a great standing with some. I'm not a big electric bass fan. Right. I love the headhunters when it's an organ mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. But because of the volume, um, and, and I, I usually play heads with the Tom Tom's tune like Max used to. That was the pro, that was where I got it from. I'm not. I don't know if it sounds like that. That's what I think mm -hmm. it's something like that. doing that since I was quite young uh, in school and with Clifford when him and Clifford made those records. I love that sound. None of that. I don't like those those heads that sound like cardboard boxes. Yeah, me neither. I'm not 22 inch double pedal guy bass drum big now i like somebody else when they do it but mm -hmm. i don't like it but and we play with the head on with the organ i could use a jazz sounding set which offers me a very broad spectrum to play out of I don't have to just play pocket and grind it down to the floor i can be more flexible and more expansive with the bigger drum set it kind of leaves you for you know this type of thing and I, I, even if I play the same ideas that I play on the small, it doesn't translate the same. Right. So I always have this inner, and I felt that way when I did this with Herbie. Mm -hmm. So there's always been this sort of not love hate because it's not like that, but it's sort of a conflict. Um, I'm really a, an acoustic guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so with Headhunters is work, I appreciate the money. I love band and the people that are in it mm -hmm. and when it's on the organ side I, I then it's really interesting because it's not like a regular organ i mean i had my own my own organ trio for many years in a club four nights a week and i played in a lot of or, organ trios with all of them practically mm -hmm. and uh so but it's not like that it's not that traditional it's it's mm -hmm. out and mm -hmm. i like that but when it's regular i'm back there chopping wood and there's no and 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 the other guys are jazz cats playing solos i find that boring as hell i i'm sorry now if otis redding or or no, somebody I could I'm sing like that i'll get down yeah and it's like i don't need to even play a fill i'll i'll chop wood with the best of them and all night four sets you won't hear a complaint out of me but yeah. then there seems to be a reason for it mm -hmm. when a guy's up there noodling and playing all the shit he knows I'm back there. It's kind of like having a, you go to your friend's house, the dog gets off on your leg. You know, you're going <laughs> to your friend's house and you're walking the fucking dog. What am I servicing? I mean, like, you know, like, that's how I look at that shit. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. That's, that's, actually, that's hilarious, <laughs> man. Well, you know, I'm with you on that. I, I, <laughs> Sorry. No, it's all cool, man. I, I mean, I started switching paths career wise about 11 years ago, almost 12 now, to this rehab thing. But uh, you know, cognitive memory and movement. But as I uh, took time off, one of the reasons I took time off, not that anybody really cares or that it matters, but I think there's a somewhat of a, a parallel here where a uh, similar thought process is I just got bored. 
and and it wasn't really fair i would pretend to like what i was doing i would never like well other than one band i actually did complain on the gig sorry guys matt john brian i did i was an asshole but anyways other than that i was pretty nice <laughs> yeah it was a, as they say in mexico is a un pandejo so uh anyways i i knew that it was time to stop because i was so bored with what we I had played literally thousands of times for decades and I just, I couldn't do it anymore. And I needed to take for decades. Yes, sir. Yeah. Wow. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm also grateful though, that I was working like five, six, seven gigs a week or more. Sometimes if it was afternoon stuff for a little session here, session there, I'm grateful for that. Cause I got to pay the electric bill. I got to pay, I got to buy food, take care of the kids and the wife. And you know, I mean, she's, working too but i mean without me it wouldn't have worked out too well income wise so i i did okay well enough good enough to get by so i'm grateful for that but i had to stop and now uh this time yeah that's my experience too i'm i'm with you so you you I'm said something you. go ahead on. i'm just saying yeah um you said something early on that you know you could play the philly joe licks and the max licks but you don't sound like them well this is a thing that comes up in a lot of the conversations is that you can't, we can't sound just like somebody else. I mean, I suppose maybe it's possible here and there, yeah. but, but we're, you're you, I'm me. And what I finally realized is I got to try to sound like Carl. Forget the, uh, the influences. Yes. I'm grateful. And I'm always going to be pulling from them because they're internally a part of my soul and in my brain but yeah oops sorry brandy she's like a two-year-old she she just wants attention because she's not getting it so if i start to pay attention of to her, course she won't care <laughs> i have a border collie named stella i love it I i've love had it. yeah i've had dogs all my life so i i understand i, I <laughs> love know? she's 13 but you're acting like a two-year-old there girl love you so much though so yeah i mean this whole thing about finding your voice i actually think it might be a little more difficult now because there's so many people out there, so many before us, but I still think it's possible. We just have to well, allow you're gonna ourselves sound to like, do that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to sound like you no matter who you copy. I mean, I hear a lot of guys in New York that think they're doing Elvin. Mm -hmm. And I can tell that they're doing Elvin, but I'm going to tell you right now, I've heard that dude, I've heard Elvin Jones a hundred million times live. Right. Yeah. None of them, including me, when I fall into that bag, I try not to go there. I don't mind doing it on Facebook screwing around or something, but on a gig, I'm not going to put that on anybody unless they say, like, we're going to do summertime in three. Give it that Elvin feel. I mean, then you're going to have to do something with, if mm -hmm. you involve triplets, you know. But just because you play triplets in the left hand doesn't mean you're doing Elvin. But when I see guys purposely doing Elvin, it never sounds like or yeah. same with Philly Joe. I mean, yeah. so you're going to be... And I, I made peace with this years ago. Hancock taught me that. He was like, I want to hear you. I don't care what mm -hmm. those other guys did. I didn't hire them. I could get Tony to come play with me anytime I want. He told me this. He said, he's my best friend. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, I want to hear you. Don't, don't, I, I don't care about Harvey Mason. I love, you know, he loved Harvey. Don't mm -hmm. play like that. Don't try to do you, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, which was also kind of weird because I, on actual proof, I played all the tunes like that, but they wouldn't let me record all the tunes in that vein where I'm more, uh, where I have it, where I'm conversational mm -hmm. because uh, money, they, they were afraid it wouldn't sell and the headhunter blew up the first one. So they want, so they kind of put the cuffs on me, play time. Oh, the one with Harvey, Which is right? fine. Yeah. 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 So but that, I'm just saying that, that was the first headhunters album, right? Com headhunter uh, was. The headhunter yeah. was. So with chameleon and all that, yeah mm -hmm. and, and harvey played then so you came in though i was going to ask you this i should know i just i can't remember you're on a few of those uh like thrust what else are you on with headhunter or herbie well i'm on one called flood that was live in japan and then i'm uh on something like herbie's greatest hits i'm on a little bit of death wish the movie Oh, okay, cool. Um, I'm on two or three things in there. I don't know which ones. And when we did Manchild, we did hangups where we actually played. 
-hmm. And on the other tracks that I was involved in, it was Herbie would just have Paul and I play, nobody else. It was the beginning of this kind of mentality where you just play a groove and play a little fill here and a little something there. So we're not even playing a piece. We're playing a thing. Oh. And you do it until I tell you to stop. Then he'd take the tape down to L.A. and put a bunch of stuff on it. I see. Okay. So that was the beginning. And I'd never had an experience like that before. I'm like, what? Just me and Paul? What about the... What? And, no, no, just you guys play. And we're, okay, sure. Wow. Is, is Paul still around? Is he still still playing? Around? Where's that? I don't know what he... Uh, uh, I don't think he's playing right now. But uh, he may be recording, but he lives in Japan. Oh, okay. And then how about uh, Benny, you said is in California? Benny Maupin. I don't know what Benny's doing. Well, I, I haven't spoken to him in a very long time. Oh, wait, I, I was in California about three years ago, and we played uh, Coomba Jazz uh, mm -hmm. Club down in mm -hmm. Santa Cruz. I think. And uh, I saw a sign that Benny was coming in there with a bassist and uh, and a drummer. Okay. Uh, and the drummer was a New York drummer, a great drummer. I can't, um, Freddie Waits' son. Uh, now, she, okay. now she waits. Okay. And then uh, Andy Summers, I know you're in touch with him, right? Andy, oh, Bill Summers, yeah. Bill, I'm sorry. Uh, we talk all the time. That's cool. We talk Bill all Summers. the time. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah, we're like family we've been that's together cool. for so long yeah <laughs> oh that's great man uh so what was and donald here? D donald uh harrison he's in the headhunters oh, right he's right. like a co yeah so we and right. him and i yeah, we talk all the time so that's great man yeah such a talent there with donald um let's see what's i gonna ask you let's see if we have any questions here um okay we answered you answered that one we have quite a few people with us this is very nice um well one of the things that i was curious about is what what, what you're looking at for uh, upcoming projects uh you know we pandemic has really slowed a lot of things down nobody's been touring for a year or more but like you're you've been busy like you said pandemic no one's working but you are but uh I've been really busy the past two months anyway. That's so to good. me, that's, that's huge after yeah. sitting around for six months and doing very little, you know? Yeah. 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 And no, I've been that, busy. Uh, uh, I've been, yeah, I've been doing records, a couple of records here and there. One, I have about a record, which is good considering now, God. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I'm doing a lot of uh, teach for different school, a couple of different schools. Oh, uh, which reminds me, I'm uh, looking at my count. Um, and uh, I got a bunch of private lessons. Guys call me all the time. Really high level guys, great drummers call me sometimes and just want to see what I'm doing, even though they can do it themselves and more. And I'm like, if you really want to, you know, call me up. It's cool. You know, so all kinds of guys show up here. Beginners, guys that can play their asses off everything. You know, like, that's cool though yeah because i definitely want at some point before we sign off whenever that is there's no hurry is uh make sure people realize that well first of all you do teach and if you're you have room for more students if, if people are looking i do yeah okay yeah oh and i just joined another thing the bob mover academy and okay. uh you can sign up there if you want less oh good to um, I'm trying to hurt a lot of people over there because there's a lot of great Michael Carvin, the great drummer is there. There's a lot. And it's not just drumming, all the instruments, bunch of guys, George Colligan, a great piano player, oh, nice. plays with Buster Williams and, and Buster's band. And, uh, oh, yeah. and also, you know, tomorrow is Buster's movie is starting. I think it plays for two days. Really? A movie on his life. I'm watching it. Uh, yeah, I'm watching it tomorrow. It's on my Facebook page. You can go there and if you scroll down, you'll find the link. And okay. hear his history, which I think is fascinating. Well, I'll definitely check that out because I'm off tomorrow. And you know, that's a guy I love. I love the way Buster plays, man. I have loved him so since the I, first man. time I heard him, probably 40 years ago or whenever it was. It's just he's got the greatest sound and the feel. It's just he's uniquely himself, and I love that. He's he's oh, done it quite a bit with Lenny too, right? 
Let they, him wait and bust They've been playing together. They sound like one guy. They're so locked. And it's they can take all kinds of chances. And I what I love about Buster is, you know, he can just swing is forget it. It's swing so great, but I mean, you know, uh, but such an the harmonic thing is brilliant that yeah. he runs down and his yeah. sound is yeah, the whole and his writing. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one of our greatest jazz musicians, and Lenny White also. Here's one thing I want to say here. People always talk about the ride symbol, swing, splang a line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it got to be nasty. You know, all of this. I agree. Lenny White's got the filthiest ride symbol of anybody I know alive right now. I'm not talking about the refer to return to forever stuff. I'm talking about his jazz stuff. Yeah. Man, it's that left hand and, and, and that sound that he gets. And I don't even know how he does it. I don't want to know how he does it. I just, mm -hmm. but I mean, when he, it, it swings so hard, but it's also dripping with grease. And to me, that's, yeah, you know, I'm not saying I can do it, but that's, that's what well, I like. That's just, it's a Lenny thing, right? I remember, uh, I've only seen Lenny once, like I was 12 or 13 with Return to, Return to Forever. But I was playing at a place in Massachusetts, Northampton, called Iron Horse or something like that. Iron Horse, yeah. yeah. And uh, we were opening for, um, I, I don't remember who, I feel bad. But anyways, uh, the sign there, or a poster, talked about Buster and Lenny coming in. And there was maybe a tenor player, too. I don't know. And I wanted to stay because they were going to be there the next night, but I just couldn't do it because I really wanted to hear Lenny play. And I wanted to see Buster because I'd never seen him. Uh, you've worked with Buster a bunch too, right? Not a bunch, but some, yeah. Some, yes. Um, uh, we'll, in most of our playing, we're both Buddhists. I'm still a Buddhist, SGI. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been involved with this since 1973. Mm -hmm. And most of the playing I've done with Buster has been through the Buddhist tip. You okay, know, I don't cool. even know. I think we maybe played. Well, yeah, we went to Japan once, but it was a Buddhist thing. It was Herbie and Wayne and me and Shunzo Ono oh, cool. and Buster Williams. But it was all under the umbrella of this thing. But still, we did play. Yeah, oh, that's <laughs> cool, played, though. You know. That's cool. Very. That's nice, man. Oh, we have a couple other people. Julia's here. Hey, Julia, I owe you a return text message. I got what you sent me this morning about Norman Doidge. One of my favorite authors. Uh, I don't have the book right here. It's all, it's the brain stuff that I love. Uh, Gary Versace, Jim McKenzie, thanks for joining. Uh, so let's go back for a second. Actually, I, I do want to talk about actual proof real brief. I know you've talked about this a thousand times. Oh, I don't but, care. It's fun. It's cool. Okay. Okay. Well, let's talk about that now then. So you and I were talking on the phone not long ago and I was telling you that uh, there's an amazing trio I was a part of my favorite musical situation ever uh, Jim O'Mahony and well whoever we had on bass was always fantastic so Jim says let's do actual proof yeah let's do it okay cool because I've been listening to that since the early or whenever it was released I got it like right away on vinyl so then I tried to play it and uh, the form of the song, I had to go through and just because I didn't have a chart, and I was too lazy to write it out. My ears are pretty good. So I just figured out these chunks of, okay, you know, this and that and that and that. And then it'll come back around and it'll start over again. And then after that, Jim plays a chart on me. And I know it could be written a lot of ways, but this one was a 16 bar phrase all in four because it actually comes out like that. Like, you're kidding me. Now I have to think about it different because I was reading the chart, but actually it was it was helpful in a way. But that song is, to me, I, I never get tired of that for a lot of reasons. But there's so much you can do on that song as as a drummer. So many different phrasings you can come up with. And uh, of course, I've heard you on that. I think there there's some bootleg lies stuff with you too. It's really cool. I love. If you go to YouTube and search Mike Clark, with Herbie or actual proof. Have you ever done that? Cause you're going to see a, a ton of stuff. It's really cool. Uh, so for you, you're, I mean, that's a song when I was talking with Tom Breckline a couple weeks ago or last week, actually, he started playing through it and he was counting. 
He says, ah, well, yeah, whatever. Thank you, Mike Clark, for that one. Great song. Great drums. Uh, so I guess I just wanted to ask you about your take on actual proof or how did you learn that? Uh, of course, I'm asking you, the professionals professional of all professionals, but I am curious conceptually how you approach that song. Okay. I went to, uh, after I got the gig with Hancock, we had to do a tour and the mm -hmm. tour was coming up immediately. So we had a two hour rehearsal. And um, he said, I got this tune I want to play called Actual Proof. It was called The Spook Who Sat By The Door from a movie. It wasn't called Actual Proof yet. Oh. And uh, uh, yes, from a movie entitled The Spook Who Sat By The Door and a hand for the, uh, for the film. So uh, when we played it, First of all, Herbie's so easy and natural to play with. He, he plays like a drummer, and he also he's monitoring everything, not just him, not just his relationship inside the band. He's hearing every breath that everybody's taken. So mm -hmm. it's like you're being observed constantly musically by him, and I'm doing the same. And uh, um, <clears throat> so. For me, I played it down maybe twice and I had it. Now, it's not that I'm real good at doing that, but he made it so easy for me that I just instinctively, the hits made sense. Mm -hmm. I didn't give them whether it was, I didn't even think whether it was a bar of this or a bar of that. Yeah. I just would set up the hits you know, and I watched his hands. I could see him do it for a couple of times. Once yeah, I knew sure. that that was part of the game mm -hmm. and it didn't take me, I vibed it out. And I played on a, well, how I used to play before they asked me to play the pocket thing was I would just play like maybe like Jack or Tony. I don't mean I play like those guys, but in the aspect that I would listen to everything and I would have a conversation underneath the soloist. And I treated all the music like that that I played and less asked not to. Mm -hmm. that's where I was coming from so I just like it was just I just heard it where he was going and I just played to it which is what you hear on the record and you yeah. know at the time I was like uh, listening to now he sings now he sobs all the oh, mild yeah, stuff sure. all the train stuff yeah East Broadway rundown with Sonny Rollin you know and and uh, um, uh, all the Lee Morgan stuff uh, uh, and Hank Mobley as much of that as I because he was so funky and mm -hmm. uh, so I just threw all, all in the hopper I mean, I can show you some of it right now. I'll do it with one hand if you want me sure. to. Sure. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so you can hear the root. And then it'll make sense. Sure. Uh, to what I'm trying to tell you. So, okay, yeah, so I'm going to play with one hand. So, okay, uh, sure. Um, let's see. Can you see the... You're seeing me. Okay. Can you see the snare and all the hi-hat? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's good. All right, so you know this Philly Joe... Philly Joe looked like... Or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And and then some Tony stuff. Mm -hmm. Some of that stuff, and then that's a, a, a little bit of some Roy Haynes action. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. That's kind of what the and that's what the beat is. I'm gonna put the phone down for a minute, so you probably won't be able to see. Okay. I don't know whether the phone. Well, I'll play the beat. So if you take those things, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah. And if you say like the bebop thing, right? And some of mm -hmm. this, some of the Tony kind of, and, and you put it in, and you put a backbeat when you want a backbeat to appear, then you got. You know how everybody yeah. plays this Elman thing. Yeah, yeah. That's it, right? Well, instead of playing it fast, I played it slow. Ah, okay. Well, it's all it's all kind of like bebop and post bop language, kind of mashed into one thing, and uh, I threw it all in the uh, blender, and that's actual proof. And then once you go to the symbol. 
and you're in the blowing section, all bets are off. Then you just improvise. That's, you know, <laughs> yeah. so you're you don't then you're not stuck on the hi hat, and you can go for what you know. You know, and that's well, you know, what it was. Yeah. It was just a natural. It came out natural. Nobody was working. We weren't in there with furrowed brows, like busting our ass. Yeah, just rolled right out. Well, you know, especially when you're with, uh, well, like somebody like Kirby, right? Like you say, he makes it easy for you. Well, that's good. But the other thing is, uh, I didn't like to have to break stuff down because then I, I would overthink things. So I'd be counting and counting got in the way of feeling. Well, sure. And then you have, I want to feel, <clears throat> if I don't count, I couldn't feel because I had to internalize it. And then eventually it was just like, okay, I got it. Then I was able to start to play it with some amount of, uh, well, do a little bit of justice to the song at least. And, and, and it felt natural after I didn't, after I internalized and felt it because the counting would drive me nuts. You know, borrow five here and three. Yeah, that's there, I can't play. One and a half here and they, ah. I can't do that. I mean, I can do it, but I mean, I would, I never even thought of music in those terms. Yeah, um, yeah. And the other thing about that piece and a lot of the things we did with the Headhunters is Paul and I had been playing together. We were best friends, Paul Jackson and I. Mm -hmm. We'd been playing together in organ trios. He played B3. Oh, cool. And, and, and he, he was an upright bass player. And he had a, an electric bass sitting in the music room of this pad that I had for years and he never went near it he managed a music store and he'd bring things home from the store and they'd stay at my crib for a while we brought home a b3 and a leslie stayed for five <laughs> years i'm serious Whoa. and yeah, yeah. and and uh, he took it back finally but but i mean uh so we had been playing that style that we played with herbie a long time before we met herbie that's the mm -hmm. oakland that's ah, that's the oakland yeah. thing yeah that's you so know cool. so yeah that's <laughs> great man yeah, you know, one of my favorite, other favorite musical situations, uh, so the the B3 and me, basically. If you get a kick-ass B3 player, man, there's just nothing like it. Whether it's funk or it's swinging or doesn't whatever. Matter. It doesn't yeah. matter because it's just, uh, there was a guy I worked with. I don't know if you ever worked with Jeff Palmer. Uh, Jeff worked oh. a lot with John Abercrombie back in the day, 80s, 90s. Uh, that was like, I remember going to the gig. This is probably 10, 11 years ago. I did one year with him every Friday night at the place in Utica called the Devereaux. I got paid $30. He got paid 50. We got two free drinks and the free food. And I would turn down gigs. It would pay like 200 bucks or whatever, because this was an institution to work with Jeff. It was, it was one of the best years of paying dues of sorts. Uh, and I loved it. It's so good. So good. So I was, uh, mm -hmm. I, I had my own organ tree. Oh, go ahead. All right. I thought you, oh, no, I got no, a I, good one for you though. You no, know, like, I'm re we're ready. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. You know, Red Fox, the comedian, Red Fox. Yep. You know, Sanford. Yes. Son. Yep. Okay. Well, okay. Like, well, I spent years on the, on the old Chipman circuit out in California mm -hmm. and, uh, I and 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 on the Red Fox show was a woman named LaWanda Page. She played Aunt Esther. I remember her on the show. Yeah. I used to tour. I used to tour with her on the Chitlin circuit. Oh, wow. Skillet, Leroy, and LaWanda, and we had an organ trio, and we would play behind them. Wow! And play up and down in, in all of the uh, Chitlin clubs, and if you want to call it that, that's during that time. Mm -hmm. So. That's cool. And uh, it was incredible. Uh, it was a great organ trio. And it was organ guitar and drums, but then it changed this guy that could play just like Junior Walker and, and sing like Junior Walker. He was a copyist kind of guy, but he was really good at it. And then it became organ sax and drums. And then they do the comedy. It was an X-rated comedy show. <laughs> and all of those people from that show ended up on the Red Fox show because this uh, uh, Skillet Leroy and LaWanda were under the umbrella of Red Fox Productions. Okay. So he would send them on these tours and we were going. Anyway, I had a lot of really crazy experience. She was my drinking buddy as well. She liked <laughs> to drink with me. And so really, it, it became really... It's a lot of really great stuff. But the trio was like, if you like fat back shuffles and real heavy funk and playing Sugar Stanley style and swinging, that was mm -hmm. the band. That was a great 
you know, uh, and it's, it, and after we were, they no longer were touring. They got the TV show. The Oregon Trail and I kept going. We could oh. we found work all over the place. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so um, did you ever meet Red Fox? No, <laughs> no, I never did. But I met Bill Cosby, and I fell into a hole. I was playing with Hancock. And it was a fr- and I had this girlfriend. I had a big Cadillac. I thought I was bad. I got a big gig. I got a big ride, seventy Cadillac. You know, beautiful, big ass hog. It was gorgeous. It's like driving a house. I love that. Oh man, it's like driving a seven forty, <laughs> and you set, and you can put two drum sets, the big trap cases in those days in the trunk, anvil totally. cases, not a problem. Yeah. But um, so I thought I was bad. That's why I, my girlfriend was like, "You need to have some platform shoes, man. Everybody's wearing them." So she bought me some, and I had them in a box in the car. I'm out behind the troubadour getting ready to play this game with Hancock. And she says, put your shoes on. I'm like, man, I don't know. I, I'm afraid to walk in those things. I've never walked in them before. And I don't know if I can play in them. Oh, come on, man. Don't you want to look cool? You know, and I'm like, oh, all right. I put them on. I fell into a hole and twisted my ankle so bad. My bass drum foot, my right foot, my oh, ankle geez, was this big. Man. So we get in the, yeah, I get, I tell Herbie, I don't think I can do the gig. He's like, what are you talking about? oh my god and uh bill cosby was there and he says man stay right there I, i'm gonna help you i used to be a coach and uh in school or somewhere or something he coached a team or something according to him mm-hmm. and he ran out to a drugstore uh this was at the troubadour so it was right there in this busy section of los angeles mm-hmm. hollywood went and got me an ace bandage and wrapped my foot up for me and he put oh, wow. a little piece of wood in there with some old basketball tricks on that would hold and i played freddie hubbard was sitting right there next to us and he came up and played a few and uh and and cosby sat down by the drums to make sure i was okay i'd never met him before. oh wow that's, that's a cool story yeah it was far off you know so when you said you fell into a hole you literally fell into a hole. wow so i had a couple more i really questions. did that was actually a uh yeah sure. it was actually a hole right Wow, man. Platform yeah, shoes. I yeah. don't think I ever wore platform shoes. Uh, but a 70 Cadillac sounds really yeah. cool. Man. See, I, oh, I love... I, I love 16 also that was killing. White I on love, white with black seats. I love cars. And uh, actually, so the, the book I wrote... Um, well, shameless promotion, but I'm just showing you because I have a story about this. It's called uh, Parkinson's Regeneration Training. I put it out last year and you know, it's disease oh, management wow. strategy. Okay. So I actually ended up helping a lot of musicians with movement stuff, some drummers too, but all over. But uh, the guy who reads the audio book uh, is a friend of mine. I met him through Jimmy Haslip. His name is Scott Hoke. So if you're ever watching TV and you're scrolling through and you see the Meekum, M-E-C-U-M, Meekum Auto Auctions, the main voice you hear on there is the host that's oh. Scott Scott Hoke, and he actually read the audiobook version of my Parkinson's book, which is on Audible. And uh, so, I mean, we text almost every day about whatever. He's also a really good bass player, too, in Indiana. So uh, we're talking cars all the time, and you know, I'll, I'll watch the show. And they had, like, a early 70s caddy on there a couple weeks ago. Oh, Went- boy. Went for a lot. It had like a 450 something or 500 engine, whatever it was. That thing was big. You They're really big. Families in the back, in the trunk. Yeah. <laughs> and they use a lot of gas, but it was worth it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, one thing, I did a lot of highway gigs in California at the time. And even I have to drive like from Oakland to Arizona to Phoenix to work, stuff like that. It was like driving in a plane. You're not tired and beat up when you get there. It's a nice car to drive. You know, I, yeah. I like that. Um, That's cool. So, so I have I have two more questions for you. Um, all right. Let me just think for a second here. I, uh, well, the, the one that's first in my mind is, is there anyone out there right now, drums or otherwise, that you're listening to that just, like, we should know about? Any up and comings, any people out there, it's like, oh, you got it. You got to hear this person or that person. Um, I think I listened to probably all the same stuff everybody else does. I, you know, I listened to all the jazz guys from my 
from the Blue Note. That's the main my listening and bebop. Oh, cool. Yeah. I, that's mainly what I do. But mm-hmm. I listen to uh, um, uh, a lot of a lot of. Uh, I, I try to listen to a lot of different stuff, and yeah. um, if it, I listen to mostly jazz, I don't listen to too much of the other stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So there's not many. Let me put it this way: there's not many people in jazz that I don't like. I don't care what time period you come from. If you want to play like they did in 1952, I was playing drums in the live then. I know what that sounds like. If you want to play like the 60s, if you want to play like whatever we're doing now, I'm cool with all of that. I'm not one of those cats. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so I'm good. And, and uh, um, uh, one of my favorite drummers I do very much is Gregory Hutchison. Oh, I God, think he Greg, can that swing. That guy is fantastic. Man. And, and, and He's a nasty, yeah, he can swing and he's got, um, you know, um, so I don't know as far as the latest new cat, I don't even know who that might be, mm-hmm. but I listen to pretty much everybody. I listen to jazz radio and I, you know, I go and I seek the stuff out. So I can't, I yeah. did have, this isn't new, but I'd never heard it before. It was new to me. I, I, I heard a version of actual proof on Facebook the other day that Tommy Campbell did in like 91 or something. Oh, really? Wow. Cool. And it was stupid good. It was killing. <laughs> it was brilliant. I mean, like I, I wrote him about it. It affected mm-hmm. me so heavy. And I've heard everybody do it. And I'm like, well, but, you know, like it's not because I was on it. it uh, to me, it's got to kind of swing some kind of way. And he was playing his ass off. And another cat I liked that did it was Chris Dave. Mm-hmm. Okay. He took it somewhere I don't even understand, but man, I dug it. It's funky. And I'm like, okay, I like this guy. You know, I'll have, to, I'll have to check those out. Um, how about this? The, 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 the only other thing, um, I hope you can hear my dog here. She's, you know, okay. yeah, I can actually. Yeah. Just give me about five minutes, sweetie. Okay. Hey, yeah. We'll, we'll do our, hey, we'll I do want to say do. one thing. I want to say yeah. one thing to you. One car I left out. We don't have to go on a big deal about this, but of course we'll just can do part. We'll do part two down the road here. Uh, yeah, so we can always. Do part I two. had a '56 Chevy with a 265 and a three-speed. Oh. Oh, it God, was stupid. Man. Yeah, man. Oh. Pea green with a white top, original. That's a beautiful car. That's a beautiful car. I, I go to car shows all the time during you know the when there's no snow when they start having them they had them here last year after a while just mask up and go and uh i mean i just i'm a car show maniac i just love to look do you work on them can you work on them do you know what's up or do you have the i have all the work done for me i was too late i didn't know how to do it and i didn't want to screw it up so i knew kids that grew yeah. up with me. They weren't kids, but they would work on the car. I'd pay them because I was playing drums all the time. I'd pay them a nice taste. And they'd get my car souped up and keep it running. I, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. It didn't take much. I'm, uh, you know, it depends upon what it is. If it's, you know, redoing a tranny, maybe not. If it's yeah. putting in a new radiator or points and plugs or a new door or uh, I'm not, uh, body work's not my thing either. Yeah, Forget about either, that. Yeah. I'm not going to yeah. do that. I can do a lot of stuff, but um, I, I actually, because it feels like therapy to me when I do anything to a car. So I, I, I kind of want to do one of the bigger jobs. I want to find something in a barn for 500 bucks. And if it takes me 10 years to get it together and make it look cool and run, so be it. But I, I would like to learn that. I, I heard that Jeff Beck is really into that. Actually, Jeff Beck is a car restoration nut. Well, if you go, I didn't know that. I, uh, if you go to Johnson City, Tennessee, out by the airport, mm-hmm. they used to have a guy who had a lawn full of 58 Chevy, 61, 62, all of it, 56. Wow. And, and they were like, it was like going to a barn. You got to drag them home and fix them. But, it's, wow. but, it, but some of them were in good shape. I actually pull my rent a car over and got out and looked at all of this, oh, you know, I'm yeah. like, Oh my God. And I found a 58, not too long ago. I mean, i saw it sitting on the street, black, mm. all restored, shiny, black, beautiful man, you know, like, uh, 
original hubcaps, the whole thing. It was a column. It was a automatic 348, uh, oh, wow. thirty five thousand dollars. I upstate. I saw it in a small town. I was just going by, and I was like, "Oh man!" I I was told me, "Rody, pull over, man. I got to <laughs> get out." You know. I I look a lot. There's a car down the road here, fifty or fifty one Chevy. It's forty five hundred bucks. It, it's it's past inspection. It's got a lot of new electrical. It's got new this, new that. I'm like, oh. Oh, oh man, no, all it needs is, oh, really is a paint oh, job. Man. I'm thinking 4,500 bucks. I, I, Six I cylinder, right? That. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really yeah. seriously thinking, like, okay, maybe, maybe so. <laughs> Just for something different, you know, because if it's up in the yeah. thirty, forty thousand dollar range, it's out of my price range. So I need to go, uh, go yeah. lower, work my way up. Uh, I grew yeah. I grew up in those cars, so there's some some kind of emotional, you know, like those were the cars of my childhood. And everything. Same here, you know that the, the the music can bring back a memory, a song can bring back yeah. memories, good or bad or whatever. The cars can do that for me. Um, the uh, I, I know what I wanted to ask you also. Um, just I just have one other question. I I probably should go soon, and I don't want to. So you know what? If you're down for it sometime month two months we should do part two because there's a lot of yeah, we can maybe we'll do plan another one, yeah. a little we can plan a little bit ahead so we don't duplicate anything too much but kind of keep traveling down a path because there's a lot of more things i'd like to ask you uh but if i take too long a little brandy here's gonna be a problem <laughs> yeah don't do that Joe. i, I Daddy, understand we I gotta get a, in the yeah. car and go yeah, somewhere yeah. we go for our daily ride we do. Yeah. and it's time so nice if if you were yeah, she's back she heard the word right uh oh so uh what are there any like top one two three let's say uh, uh before you were gigging out professionally which you did very early in your life uh, like pivotal moments for you, whether it's you're playing in a situation where you discovered somebody new and you heard them and said, oh man, this is just like a huge window just opened with fresh sonic candy for me or something like that. Any absolutely highly pivotal moments for you that you want to share about? I think uh, when I was a kid, I played uh, at the famous store in New Orleans and I would get to play with some well-known New Orleans musicians, and they, and, and, and they had great drummers. And I would mm -hmm. sit in, and I watched those drummers play. And it was a j j straight ahead jazz. This wasn't the, the street beats and no funk or anything. This was way before that it got popular. Mm -hmm. um, um, that all affected me. I mean, I don't play in New Orleans style, but that affected me. Mm -hmm. And then. Uh, uh, you know, when I went to hear Max, that really affected me. When I heard Shelly Mann, that oh. really affected me. Live, way back when he was hitting hard. Um, uh, Philly Joe, I heard several times. Papa Joe, that affected me. Louis Belson affected me. Oh, Koopa. Yeah. Sam Woodyard really affected me. And I played in a, in a lounge in Vegas where every night I would go in the big room and hear Sonny Payne. Oh, that really wow. affected me, you know? And uh, yeah. uh, in Texas, I played the blues with a lot of well-known blues cats. We can talk about that another time. Yeah, let's and do some that of those, next time. Yeah. Almost every one of those drummers, I don't even know some of their names. Those guys not only affected me, they cold cocked my ass. I mean, I was, they, I, like, my knees would buckle, it <laughs> swung so hard, man. And, and, yeah. uh, uh, the first time I heard James Brown live and Ray Charles every time oh, affected me, yeah. you know, and then Sonny Rollins and, uh, uh, um, you know, and then of course, when I heard Elvin and Tony live, I, that was, uh, yeah, it's all affected me, yeah, <laughs> Not, yeah. I mean, you know, like heavily, uh, you know, and emotionally too. I mean, you know, Oh yeah. You know, I think that's the thing too, is that the emotions when you're just, hit like that like uh when i saw yeah the tony the first time in 82 I, I just couldn't take my eyes off of him i didn't even pay any attention to harry hancock that night hardly i was watching tony i was just i stayed for two sets but um you know that shelly man's name 
comes up a lot. I have a bunch of vinyl of Shelly on the mainstream label. Some of it's from Shelly's manhole, uh, the the place he owned. And then uh, Gary Hobbs, actually, we were talking last week. Gary has one of Shelly's drum sets. Whoa. I don't know if you knew that or not, but he's got well, I don't know that. Set. I did yeah. not. I, did. I think he might have restored it because pretty sure he was like pointing it out and it looked, it looked nice. So, yeah, my dad, see, my dad and my mom were really into big bands, you know, Kenton. So you, you got with Kent, you got Shelly Mann, you got Mel Lewis, you've got uh, sure. Jerry McKenzie, you got Von Olin, and then Peter came in. And but you know, Woody's people like uh, some of his uh, um, Joe LaBarbera, you know, Danny the Imperial lives about Jake five Hanna. minutes from me, yeah, Jake Hanna. And oh, and, really? I mean, you know, yeah, Danny's Man, down tell, the road. Please He's, tell Danny, hey, for me, I took lessons yeah. with him a long time ago, and it was a blast. Every lesson might have cost 40 bucks at the time when it took about three hours because between the vodka and the record collection we eventually somehow got a lesson in <laughs> and it was a blast right so we had uh but he plays bass upright bass really well and of course his time is really oh i heard good. this yeah uh, yeah yeah i yeah. mean i've okay. i've seen him play gigs on bass at these little clubs uh a, a few years ago he hasn't done it in a while, I don't think, but where he's the bass player, upright bass, and he plays piano really well. Wow. So wow. he would play upright bass while I'm playing drums and he would just swing my ass off. He he forced he he made me not with force, just the way he played made me find a pocket better and feel feel things better. Sure. So I was very lucky. Yeah, Danny's well, funny too, man. He's freaking Well, that's funny a lot him. of it. Yeah. And, you know, I met him when he was, I think he was with Maynard's band. He was. And, and yeah. I think he was. And we played opposite him with Hancock somewhere in a jazz festival in Phoenix. And it was the first time I've seen Joel LaBarbera play live as well. Oh, wow. He yeah. was with Maggion, Chuck oh, Maggion. Oh, yeah. that's, I forgot. And, uh, They're and, all Rochester and, guys, the LaBarberas. Yeah. 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 Who's that cat up there? Ruggiero? Vinny? You know oh, about Vinny him? Ruggiero. Remember Vinny Ruggiero? He passed, but his son plays with yes. Chuck a lot, I think. And I can't remember his son's name. Great drummer, yes. though. Great drummer. Yeah, and Mike Melito. Both of them are great. Work. The old man was great, and, and Charles is great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Charles. That's There's a the Philly Joe stuff right there in that book. Oh, my drum teacher in college, Mick Luander, uh, took a lot of lessons with Vinny Ruggiero and he had all these charts and stuff. So that's where I really got digging yeah. into a lot of the, the Philly Joe, the Max, and actually a lot of Louis stuff, but I I'd seen Louis Belson a few times by that point, but now to dig in and the charts from like, uh, the diplomat speaks album, there's some great arrangements on that one. Um, but uh, we got to do part two. <laughs> we got to do part two, Mike. All right, bro. Hey, you know what's going? You, you know what's happening right now, and I can't see where my power is in my phone. But you're starting to break up, oh, so okay. I think my battery, my phone battery, is kind of is kind of on the way out here. I could it recharge. Might. I mean, I could go find a plug, but I think we're at the end of it, or it feels well, like we are. Like, we we should you know? probably uh, go just because I have a puppy here who needs to eat and do stuff. And uh, yeah, for sure, it's going to be a problem. And my mom just tuned in. Hey, mom. I'll send you the link to the YouTube video later. So, uh, yeah, well, hey, man, it's been a pleasure. Anytime I talk with you, it's always Thank you, Carl. It's been my pleasure, bro. Well, thanks. Yeah. And I want to tell you this one thing in closing. You know, you, you know how you can't say ride in front of your dog? Right in front of your what? You know, if you say R, if, if you say oh, R, yeah, 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 I do. Yeah. In front of uh -huh. your, yeah. Yeah. We can't, we have to spell cheese. We can't say cheese. It has to be spelled. <laughs> She'll go to the ice box and there's no all... funny. <laughs> Stella <laughs> likes cheese. Brandy loves cheese. In fact, uh, I, I, I just said that word. She, she just heard that word when I said ride and she's like waiting. And uh, we have to spell that word. We do that. Uh, R-I-D-E. Right. R-I-D. I think she learned how to spell it though, honestly. Of R -I -D -E. course. Oh, thanks, daddy. Let's get in the car. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Same thing. Yeah. 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 They're smart. Well, ah. uh, I want to thank, every, thank you. everyone who's watching. Thank you. Malcolm, Rich, uh, Anthony, Mike, my friend, Micah. How you doing, Micah? Mom, everybody. 
And it was a great hang, Anthony said. It was, man. And we'll do another one. I'll be in touch with you. Okay, Mike? Cool, man. Cool. And more right. than anything, right. thanks to you, my friend. It's great to see you again. Thank you, Carl. I appreciate that, man. Okay. All Enjoy right, that friend. Mustang, man. You know? <laughs> okay. Woo. You got it. Uh, All right. I bro see okay. you later buddy okay bye bye okay. see you everybody nice to see all you guys and gals okay over now thanks a lot man bye bye that was a blast